Well, hello, everyone. Um, I hope that wasn't silent for you, but for the panelists, we didn't hear anything. Um, considering the music, that might have been a plus. We didn't have any holiday uh, theme on tonight. So my name is John Ball, professor of forestry here at South Dakota State University, sitting in my office, and uh, this continuation of Garden Hour. Uh, during the summer, of course, this goes on a lot more frequent because things do happen at a fairly rapid pace. But even in the winter, it's kind of nice to get together and talk about what's going on periodically. So uh, tonight, uh, I'll finish with talking a little bit about uh, what's going on in the outdoor world and obviously a little bit about Christmas trees. But uh, I'm joined tonight by two other panelists and uh, Rhoda and Claudia. And so I'm going to kick it over to Rhoda to say what she's going to talk about tonight. Good evening, everyone. Uh, since many times people get uh, houseplants as gifts during the Christmas season, I'm going to be talking a little about Christmas-themed houseplants. Now, that's cool. And, and when I walk through the stores now, not only do they have Christmas trees sitting outside, but they got a lot of houseplants in there, too. And uh, Christmas cactus, you know, obviously, and a lot of them don't look like they've been well cared for. Uh, so, you know, might be a little bit on selection, too. But uh, we also have another guest with us tonight, and I'm going to turn over to Claudia, who will introduce herself and also begin the program tonight. So, Claudia, turn it over to you. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. I'm Claudia Vatsit, and I'm a nutrition field specialist for Extension. I am doing this in my car and my battery is at 32 percent um so let's hope it stays alive because my car charger will not work um but today i'm gonna talk to you guys um a little bit different than i think you guys are used to on the garden hour usually i talk about um food preservation and all of that stuff but there's not much gardening going on right now so what better other than gardening than to talk about just food. Um, so I'm gonna go over some, just some food eating habits that can happen around the holidays and then just go into some, maybe some different ways you can use your um, stockpiles of squash and frozen corn and stuff like that. So first I just have some quick, um, I guess healthy eating tips during the holidays. Cause a lot of times it can be like a scary time with food sometimes um so i'm just gonna run through some tips and like why we recommend them and all that um one of the biggest ones is eat breakfast unlike thanksgiving a lot of people like to postpone and not eat to save up for the big meal but you are actually more likely to eat more if you do not eat breakfast because your body is gonna kind of go into like a like minor starvation state so it's gonna cling to everything you eat and store it versus use it quickly to metabolize it since it knows you're going to keep fueling it throughout the day. Um, so yes, I'd always eat breakfast. And then also take your time eating. It can take up to 10 minutes for your um, stomach to tell your brain like, whoa, we're full down here. We don't need any more. Um, so that's why a lot of times all of a sudden it's just like, holy cow, I am so full. Um, because it does take a little while for your stomach to tell your brain that. So um, a good rule of thumb is just to try to take your time eating. Take a few bites, let it digest, and then take a few sips of water or a drink and just enjoy the food you're eating. And then let your food settle before going up for seconds. This is another thing is sometimes, again, we don't um, listen to our body enough. And sometimes we're full and no one really likes getting that disgustingly full feeling. I know I don't. You start sweating the alarm and you just don't feel good. Um, so just kind of sit down and relax before you can go up for seconds just to listen to your body. Drink water. You want to drink water all day because that will help um, kind of flow with all the sodium we usually have. Um, just lets everything digest easier. Um, and then I just like to say venture out of your comfort zone. If there's a vegetable or a dish, you usually say, heck no, I don't want to eat. Maybe just give it a tiny taste because you never know if what you used to not like is what you like now. 
and pictured I have my favorite Thanksgiving breakfast, um, a bagel with cream cheese and salmon and capers. We have that almost every Thanksgiving morning. So it's, I look forward to breakfast. Okay, Let's see if I can get this to go to the next one. All right, so um, I kind of picked what some of the big crops we have left, um, which would be squash, carrots, potatoes, corn, jam, and jelly. So I'm gonna kind of go over a few things. They may be new to you, they may be old news for you, but um, just gonna give you some ideas of foods you can make for the holiday season. So for squash, um, a lot of times we always just eat mashed squash, which that's good, or roasted squash. Um, but a few other ways you can try and use is in spaghetti. A lot of us can use spaghetti squash as um, a dish, but you also can cream squash and make a sauce out of it, or just put roasted squash into your pasta and it adds another extra great taste. You can make squash lasagna, which you probably use more of like a white base sauce for that. And then I forget if these are some type of empanada or some other pastry, but they are filled with squash in the center picture on the bottom. And you can make them savory or sweet. That's one thing with squash is it's very universal. And then there's also cookies. Um, I love making squash cookies. They're very simple. Um, I'm also gluten-free, so no matter what, my cookies' textures are weird, so I usually just throw squash in there, a little bit of gluten-free flour, and we kind of play with it. But yeah, lots of ways to use your squash you have sitting in your cellar or mudroom or anything. And then we have carrots. Carrots, I was trying to think of some unique things to do, but I wasn't very successful. Um, you can always do your veggie tray, which I don't know if you guys have seen. A lot of people are doing, oh, I hope my computer doesn't die. Um, a lot of people are doing, they take a styrofoam tree and they put vegetables on it or um, certain cheeses, olives, stuff like that. And they make like a tree looking veggie tray. So those are very neat. You can make um, carrot sticks, which are just like french fries, but you use carrots instead. Um, to give you a little bit more nutrients um, and some carotenoids. You can always make soup and then you can roast them. Nothing too exciting you can do with carrots, but if you guys know of anything exciting, um, you can let me know. And then we have potatoes. I'm going to turn my camera off just to hopefully save some battery life because we're draining really quick. Um, so for potatoes, a given roasted potatoes, potato soup. Um, but a few other things you guys could do um, is making your own gnocchi at home. I've done this and I did not have like, usually you wanna send it through like a sieve that will help purify it or use a food processor. I am still, you know, paying loans off and stuff. So I don't have extra money to spend. So I actually mashed all my potatoes very finely with like a fork on the counter. It took forever, but anyways. Um, it turned out really good because you basically just flour, eggs, and potatoes, and then you roll them, toss them in some water, and toss them in some, I used like a creamy mushroom sauce, and it, they were delicious. Um, poutine, um, I've never made this at home, but it, you definitely could. If you can make your own fries, all you really need is gravy and cheese. Um, just something extra, which people don't usually, I guess, think of that, like let's make poutine at home. So just a fun thing. Um, there's potato rolls. Um, and again, just using potatoes to make your rolls. And then again, we have um, kind of like an empanada, but I think this I was going for pierogies. You could try and make your own pierogi because that's like mostly potato. So, and again, with all these, you can just look up any recipe online and they should be, they should be good. And then we have corn. So we have cornbread. Um, you can play with your cornbread, add cheese, add green onions, add bacon, um, add jalapenos, add actual chunks of corn. Um, you can really play with it. Add honey, add syrup. There's a lot of things you can do with um, cornbread and you can make it universal if you want it like sweet with the chili or you can make it savory with the chili. There's just lots you can do with that. Um, you can make corn pancakes, which I saw, and I think they were like shredded potato and corn kind of together. Um, 
or they were fritters, something. I forget what the fritters were made with. Might be on the next few slides, but maybe it was corn fritters. Um, I wish I could see faces because I could see if anyone's nodding. Um, but anyways, you can make those at home. And then down below, it's kind of a lot of the same. You can make corn salsas, add your corn onto nachos. Um, if you've leftover potatoes, you can always make um, like a like a burrito bowl, but with mashed potatoes, gravy, corn, turkey, or whatever you used. Um, but corn's one of those I think everyone usually has at the table around the holiday. And then lastly, we have jelly and jam. Um, I just had someone call me because they're like, I've had this, I've had all these jars of jelly in my um, cellar for almost two years. And he said he had over 30 jars. So he's like, what can I do with them? And I was like, that's tough. Cause that's a lot of jars of jelly. I was like, you can give them away, but they, they say the recommended shelf life for preserved foods is 12 to 18 months. So you're kind of getting to the older end of that. Um, so I was like, just try to eat it, bake it into stuff. You can freeze bread um, and just kind of go from there. But um, some of my favorites, if you guys like brie cheese, um, it's a very buttery cheese. You can add some jam on there. It's really good if you do like a jalapeno jam on there because then it, the creaminess of the cheese just goes really well with the spicy and sweet flavor. You can do South Dakota's beloved kolaches because those are good with any flavor. You can add um, jam onto a burger. I know it's getting really popular. Jalapeno jam can be used too. Um, but some people have been putting like a strawberry or raspberry jam on burgers. You can make marinades. Um, you can add it to charcuterie boards, like a little jar of jam to put on some bread. And then another thing um, is adding it into your cinnamon rolls. So kind of making them like a jelly roll of some type. Um, just lots you can do with jellies and jams. And then I believe... That is what I got for you guys. I didn't have my contact information, but um, you can probably get it from someone. Um, let me try and figure out how to stop sharing. But yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> you didn't mention Ludafisk. Oh, well, that's why you're here, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. uh... Yeah, well, we eat Ludafest to prove we can. Okay, yes. <laughs> and that, so, yeah, I was just waiting for it. I was hoping to get some recipes of what to do. I, you know, bacon on it with butter. Oh, it, yeah. it's, and, and once a year. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes pretty good. All right, well, hey, thanks for that. Uh, you can now get out of your car uh, <laughs> and, and move inside. Uh, so we certainly appreciate you coming and, and giving us some holiday hints. And then uh, we'll turn it over for Rhoda. So go ahead, Rhoda, and house plants. All right. And... Good evening, everyone. I hope you've had a good start to your Christmas season. Uh, my mother just turned 98 last week and she was getting bouquets and and houseplants. I had to laugh. She got one, one houseplant that the label on it actually said green plant, period. No, <laughs> nothing more about what that plant that was green might be. Uh, I guess they were saving labels by just making one label for everything. Anyway, let's get to Christmas flower arrangements to start with. And you may have seen this before at Valentine's Day, but just a reminder, uh, when you get that uh, bouquet of flowers and go to put it in the vase, one of the first things you do is get rid of any of those leaves that are going to be below the water level in the vase, uh, because they'll just sit there and rot and contribute bacteria in. And we, we don't want those. So remove those and then cut off about a half inch to an inch from the stems. Do this under running water. 
and make sure your knife or pruners is clean and then place in the water immediately after cutting. Um, and you can use a floral food uh, and be very careful about the rate that's that's specified. Don't just take the whole packet and throw it in a small vase uh, that actually might backfire on you. So be sure to follow the label instructions. Um, and then it, it will help keep your um, arrangement looking fresh much longer if you change the water daily. And again, you might want to just uh, make up a big pot of that floral food with water and, and add that in daily as well. Uh, you can recut the stems if, if you've got room on them. Sometimes you don't have that much room, but if you've got a fairly tall uh, arrangement, uh, you can recut the stems once in a while. I don't know if I'd do it daily, but... And then they should be kept at temperatures between 50 and 75. And of course, don't put it right in front of the heat vent or, or right in front of a, an open window with uh, uh, cold temperature, cold air blowing in. Uh, another thing you might not have thought about, but sometimes at the holidays, people have baskets of, of fruit uh, that are out for people. Um, you don't want to put those fruit baskets next to your floral arrangements because they're emitting ethylene and ethylene is the one thing that really actually tells flowers to uh, go ahead and shed the petals. So uh, be aware of that. And then I'm going to give you a reminder. Uh, if you have cats in your home and particularly if those cats are adventurous, like to get up on things, uh, my cats like to knock over uh, floral arrangements. That's great fun. Uh, remember that lilies, which sometimes, especially the white ones, show up in bouquets at Christmas time. They're extremely toxic to cats. Even the pollen, if it gets on them and they lick it off, can lead to acute kidney failure. So uh, be very careful with that and put them up where where the cats can't get to it and make sure that the pollen's not uh, falling off and falling onto the ground. Um, people often wonder about peace lilies uh, since they share the same common name, but peace lilies are a little different uh, uh, genetically. Um, and they can make the, your cat sick if, if he chews on the leaves like a lot of house cats and a lot of house plants, um, but it's not the really extremely toxic like like these lilies, day lilies and, and uh, hybrid lilies are, are really the ones to watch for. And if you only have dogs, um, they might make your dog sick, but but they don't have the extreme uh, threat that that they have for cats. So back to our Christmas, you see a lot of Norfolk Island pines in the in the stores these days. Sometimes they're decorated. Sometimes they've been sprayed with glitter. Uh, and uh, they look very attractive. They're nice and full. Uh, when they come from the store, this one, as you can see, actually has two liters. Um, and I had one like that, and one became dominant and the others just kind of hanging out uh, down down below yeah uh, uh, and probably eventually i'll i'll remove it all together but for right now it's still going um, so you can decorate them with small ornaments or paper chains if you've got kids um, lightweight ornaments uh, you can put lights on them and again watch for for lighter weight uh, uh, lighting sets. They should have bright filtered lights, uh, which during the winter you could put it in direct light uh, <laughs> uh, from probably November through February or so. Um, after that, it probably shouldn't have direct light or it should have, you know, a, a light lacy curtain in front of it or something to to uh, protect it from from real strong sun, although in uh, 
where they're native from. Of course, they're out in the out in the direct sunshine uh, year round. So uh, this is an example of a of a tree that's that's probably New Zealand or somewhere like that. Um, and John will tell you <laughs> where for sure. <laughs> um, so they get very tall, 100 feet. So hopefully it doesn't get that in your house or you're going to have problems, going to have to move the roof. Uh, they like to be kind of evenly moist during the summer. So the top of the, the pot should dry out just a little bit. Stick your finger down in. If it's still dry, then it's time to water. If you stick your finger down like an inch or so and, and it feels moist, don't water it. Uh, especially during the winter when we've got less light, it's using less water. Although uh, uh, the air in your house may be drier too. So keep an eye on it and uh, know that you can let it dry out slightly, but shouldn't dry out completely, of course. And again, sort of like the flowers, keep it away from furnace vents. And it actually likes temperatures around 70 degrees. So Christmas cactus, which we mentioned earlier, um, there's actually three kinds of, of this type of plant. One is Thanksgiving cactus, one is Christmas, and uh, one is actually an Easter cactus. That's a little different creature, but often gets lumped together. Uh, mine at home and here in the office is actually a Thanksgiving cactus and it blooms uh, from Thanksgiving and it's just about done blooming now. So uh, again, it, the cactus name should give you a clue that you're going to want to keep it a little bit more on the dry side, uh, maybe a little drier than than uh, than the Norfolk Island pine. And again, cool room temperatures. Now, if you want it to flower um, in the house, I found I do pretty well just by leaving it in my, it's kind of a southeast window. Uh, and I often have those windows open at night in the fall. So the temperatures can get down to maybe 50, 55. And that's enough to cause it to set the floral buds. Uh, keeping it on the dry side can also sort of turn on that switch to form the form the flowers. Um, so those are, are two ways to get the flowers. It's going to flower best when daytime temperatures are under 65. That's during the time that it's forming the buds. Once it's uh, forming the buds, uh, sometimes you might want to move it out to where you can see it better in the room, but Remember a, a real drastic change in light or uh, temperature might cause it to drop those flowers more quickly. So it may be a trade-off. Um, the other way to get it to force flowers without the temperature is complete darkness for 12 to 14 hours a day for three to four weeks. Kind of like poinsettias, only it's only three or four weeks. Uh, instead of six or eight weeks for poinsettia or, or longer. <laughs> um, whoa, and I'm going to poinsettia a little bit quicker. Um, that is complete darkness and it cannot be interrupted because if you shine a flashlight on it or, or your cat knocks off the cover you had on it, <laughs> you can tell I have cats. Um, that little bit of light is enough to switch uh, the hormones in the plant and keep it, start resetting it. So you'd have to go for another three to four weeks from that point. So you can see why I do it with the with the temperature alone because it's to me it's much easier and I've always had my plant uh, flower without any issues. And then second of all, uh, the poinsettia has a flowering plant. Um, again, 
direct light this time of year or bright in direct light during the summer. And I'm not going to go into how to keep it and get it to reflower because that's fairly uh, in-depth instructions. You can go to our website, extension.sdstate.edu, and type in poinsettia. And I believe there's some good instructions on that uh, of how to cut it back and, and keep it during the summer. And then uh, to stimulate flowering next year, same as the uh, Christmas cactus, except it's six or eight weeks that you have to remember to keep it dark, maybe maybe put a grow light in a closet you never use or something. So all you have to do then is remember to water it, which would probably be my downfall. Uh, but so uh, it's much easier uh, to re reflower Christmas cactus than poinsettia, uh, which is probably why people tend to just buy what they can find in the store, unless they're up for good challenge. Uh, you want to keep it evenly moist. Just let the soil dry a little bit before watering. This is the euphorbia, and euphorbias uh, tend to be uh, more drought resistant uh, types of plants or will uh, rot fairly easily if it's overwatered. So uh, if it comes in that foil wrap when you bring it home from the store, uh, remember that that will hold water. So you either want to get rid of that or poke holes in the bottom and then put it on a plate so that you can can monitor. Um, so, uh, but if you don't, I've seen people water it and that just acts <laughs> like a big pond eventually and then your plant rots, which you don't want to have happen. And again, cool room temperature, 65 to 70. So if you've got an argument about with your spouse about how warm your house should be during the winter. Uh, if you wanna keep your plants nice, this is your answer. Again, avoid heat ducts, drafts from windows and doors, etc. cetera. Um, and then choosing the poinsettia. And man, there's every color of poinsettia out there now. Uh, some not naturally, <laughs> some naturally. Uh, they've been bred uh, between the the white poinsettia and the red poinsettias, We've got all kinds of shades of pink and all kinds of variation in the in the pattern of the leaves and so forth. Uh, the blue uh, poinsettias have have either been painted or spray painted, <laughs> actually, uh, which is pretty bizarre to me. Or glitter, you see glitter on them a lot as well. Uh, the one thing that you do want to look for when you're pointing it at, picking out your poinsettias is, is to look for bright yellow uh, centers. And uh, if they're starting to go on their way out, getting ready to drop leaves, these will have already flowered and started to turn brown. And that, that means they're going to leave lose these uh, sepals much more quickly. And I think other than that, I wanted to remind you, uh, so I'm not sure if John had this, uh, that the next garden hour will be Tuesday, February 13th. You can remember it's the day before Valentine's Day. And Amanda Bachman, Prairie Walk Lane will be talking about Master Gardeners and uh, Madeline Shires is our plant pathologist is going to be on uh, to talk about some of the, the common diseases. And that's it for for me, John. All right, sounds great. Let me hit share here. And I think I've got it. Let me see one more thing I gotta hit, come on. There we go. All right, well, hey, I like that. And uh, there, by the way, there's Norfolk Island, which is to the northeast of Australia. And then there's Christmas Island, which is to the northwest so they're not close but i've had people think that norfolk island pines come from christmas island uh but no santa claus comes from christmas island no there truly is a christmas island uh down there a nice nice resort if you ever get a chance uh but um 
I'm going to change and talk about those outdoor plants. And for those that are frequent, uh, what, viewers of Garden Hour, one of the things I always mention is growing degree days. And believe it or not, we've been accumulating them in the last couple of weeks still uh, because we're getting uh, days above 50 uh, in a lot of areas of the state. So it's been warm, as I'm sure all of you noticed, and your heating bill hopefully is down uh, correspondingly. But uh, we've just about hit 3,000 uh, for rapid, uh, just beat it out in, in uh, Aberdeen. And of course, we're much higher than that in Sioux Falls. And that's higher than we have in, in a number of years. But you know what's interesting? And I should have put this on here, but I've had some calls from people around Thanksgiving time that had lilacs in bloom. You know what happened? We had that little cold snap. And that fooled lilacs, which are easily fooled. Uh, and some of them started to break bud again. Uh, so we often see a, a few flowers appearing in late summer, but that cold snap we had, and then it got warm again, has caused a couple of plants to kick in flowers in the last couple of weeks. Um, what that means generally is you're going to see fewer flowers next year. Um, they, if we get a real deep freeze soon, that might kill some tissue as well. Uh, plants have been going through enough cold that they're acclimating for winter. As long as we don't suddenly have it drop right off the edge and drop into the, uh, uh minuses, um, in that, but, uh, it's been actually a good year in terms of temperature. It's been a bad year in terms of rainfall. We had very little in the Eastern part of the state. We had a lot in the Western part of the state. It was kind of the uh, the reverse. But what else should you be doing? If you live in Lincoln, Minnehaha, Turner, or Union County, this is a good time to get down any of your infested ash trees. We spent a lot of time talking about how to tell an infested ash tree, so I'm not going to go through that again tonight. But now is a good time to get rid of those trees because if they are infested, the insects inside, and we don't want it coming out next year and spreading to surrounding trees and a good time to remind everyone that you cannot move ash wood out of those counties any time of the year and in any form in other words you say well i've chipped it nope uh, i've debarked it nope uh, i split it no um, so the wood has to be used in those counties now you can move it from one county to the next because you're staying in within the quarantine. Uh, but some people have confused the quarantine with some cities' uh, restrictions. And this is a state quarantine, so no time. And by the way, you can't move hardwood firewood out of these counties either. And the reason being is a lot of people couldn't tell the difference between ash firewood and um, some other species. Oh, and gee, I should mention this too, and that is... If you go to a lot of these gas station convenience stores and you look at the firewood, it's in, it's was infested ashwood. In fact, when I pulled up to one place, I looked at their firewood sitting next to the gas pump and I look and it was just covered with galleries from emerald ash board. I went, oh my goodness. But it came from Iowa and was properly heat treated. But you know what's interesting? This year I'm seeing more firewood that is actually from infested ash. That's uh, such an issue in Minnesota and Iowa, particularly Iowa, where they have a lot of dying ash trees that you, know, you got to use it for something. And as long as it's heat treated, it's fine to use, but it's just interesting how the market's been overwhelmed uh, with that treated firewood. So the treated firewood treated by a company following the USDA requirements can be moved. The firewood you cut and store on the side of your garage cannot be moved out of the quarantine areas. Uh, but right now, all the little emerald ash borers are burrowing deeper into the wood. Uh, they feed in the phloem tissue just beneath the bark. But in the wintertime, they burrow deeper down into the sapwood. So that gives them a little bit more protection from a woodpecker trying to find them. And then also a little bit warmer. Uh, because that's going to provide a little additional insta insulation. But they're curling just like a cat for the winter, and they'll remain that way until about 250 growing degree days when they kind of shrink 
go into a pupil stage, and then about 500 to 550 groin degree days, about the end of May is when the adults will emerge. And by the way, if you cut an ash tree down this winter that's infested, the adults will emerge next summer. It, uh, the fact that it's firewood does not matter at this point, and that's why they're the concern about moving firewood out of the quarantined areas. Took this picture today. That's on our campus, South Dakota State University. And you'll notice we've got three Austrian pines there. And the one to the right doesn't look very happy. And it just recently decided to look unhappy. And it's infected with the disease known as pine wilt. So pine wilt disease. And what it causes is the rapid collapse of the foliage in the trees. And when I walked up to that, all the needles are just hanging there just brown and crisp where three weeks ago the tree looked fine still and when you touch the twigs they'll snap in your hand they've dried out so quickly this disease is statewide it's affecting austrian pines and scots pines and even some large mugo pines throughout the entire state the disease does not occur on ponderosa pines so you can plant those to your heart content but for decades now, I've been warning people, you may want to stop planting Scots pine and Austrian pine because the disease was killing trees in Illinois and Nebraska and a number of other, and Iowa. And then it's gradually been moving north through South Dakota. And it's on the North Dakota border right now. And uh, you might say, well, why is it moving? Warmer summers. And I'm serious on that one. Uh, you need a mean July temperature of about 72 degrees. And that's a mean and our summers, no matter how you want to look at it, our summers have gotten warmer in the last 20 years. And that's allowed this nematode to create this disease in these trees. And North Dakota gets a little warmer there. We're going to find the disease there. But uh, again, these are on our naughty list if we were writing to Santa, because there's no point in planting Austrian pines and Scots pines because they're just going to die uh, probably in about 20 years anyway, just when they start looking nice. But if you have one that quickly faded in the last couple of weeks, they have Sawyer beetles in them. And right now, those Sawyer beetles are in the larval stage, uh, kind of worm-like. And you know what's kind of interesting is the disease is caused by a nematode, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But in the spring, when the tree's crisp, it's kind of like a Pringles potato chip. It's so dry. The nematodes move to the Sawyer beetles. And then as the Sawyer beetles molt into pupae and adults, they're right there and hitch a ride with the Sawyer beetles. So that's the only way they're going to move out of a tree. And the Sawyer beetles start emerging about May 1st. In fact, I prefer April 1st as a deadline. Any Austrian or Scots pine that faded very quickly this fall or even in the last couple of weeks, uh, you definitely want to cut it down and burn it. Do not stack it. The Sawyer beetles will still come out of it carrying that little nematode that I'm showing you there. I mean, literally thousands hitch a ride. And they'll move to nearby healthy Scots pines and, or Austrian pines and infect those. So sanitation is important for two things, our emerald ash borer, let's get rid of infested ash, and the uh, pine wilt disease, let's get rid of in, infected Austrian pines and Scots pines. Oh, and then squirrels. Squirrels are out right now. Uh, there's one in my, in, uh, my neighbor's yard. And what it's feeding on is honey locusts. They love honey locusts in the fall and the winter. And, and there's a lot of reasons. A new theory is that they're looking for calcium, but that's more of a spring feeding for the young squirrels, kind of build strong bones. They don't drink a lot of milk. Uh, so they got it at calcium somewhere. And you'd be amazed how much calcium is in the phloem tissue here. It's also sweet, so it's tasty. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. I think they just do it to annoy us, to be honest with you. They just love to stand, sit up there and just tear the bark off the trees. And unfortunately, it does harm the trees. But I was surprised to see how much damage they were doing this fall. Generally, we don't see a lot of damage until February or March. And if this is any indication of what the year is going to be, we're going to find some really stripped trees by, um, by spring. And by the way, last year was a banner year. 
it was amazing. The squirrel population, like the rabbit population, just exploded, and they caused a lot of damage. Well, what else do we have going out there? What else can you kind of protect your trees from? We have a disease, as we call it, more a disorder, uh, that's called Southwest disease. And it gets that name because it occurs in the southwest sides of trees. And it occurs on the lower trunks of thin bark trees. So it's very common on maples, Freeman maples, such as the Autumn Blaze, Sierra Glen, and a number of others that are incredibly popular trees, too popular in my opinion. Uh, but those are very susceptible to this problem. And even honey locusts get it. And you might wonder, well, well, how do they get this? And you can see the canker that occurred on this tree. Um, that's right on campus here at SDSU, uh, that the setting sun or that late afternoon sun actually warms up that bark. Uh, you know, think of yourself standing next to the south side or the southwest side of a building, even in winter. It can be actually quite warm. Well, what happens is they don't have enough cork cells really insulated. And when that sun sets, that bark temperature just plummets to whatever the ambient air temperature is and damages the tree. And that's what you get. And that's the same tree. Now you're looking at the southwest side of it. I mean, it, you can almost use it as a compass. And so if sun, if winter sun doesn't reach the bark, well, you don't have this problem typically. We, we have some other problems, frost cracks and that, but we don't get the southwest disease occurring. So, so what can you do? You can put a tube around the tree and you all got great weather to do it in over the next couple of days. My gosh, 50 degrees. Uh, most of you don't have snow on the ground. But a drain tile or a tree guard on the lower four to five feet, is, and that's typically where we see the problem, and you want it tight with the ground. Otherwise, you just made a home for mice. Uh, so make sure you got it right snug to the ground so nothing can get crawl underneath it and make a nice little house for the winter because they'll end up girdling it. Um, you can see here's a nice little tree, and I did not take that picture this year. We have not had that much snow yet, but I took that a number of years ago, and the tree's gotten bigger. But you notice that when it was young, they were putting around. You don't have to do it when they get much larger, um, but uh, when they're small like that, it really helps. But the big thing is you want an air gap between the bark and the tube. The tube is not going to insulate in the sense that it's going to keep it warm. What you're going to get is that air gap, so we do not get that rapid temperature change. Um, so don't wrap the trunk with that crap paper or wrap the trunk with that uh, plastic that just coils around it because you've got it right up on the trunk, and that doesn't insulate very well. Air is a great insulator. So try to have an air gap, and if it's going to touch the side of a tree, make sure that's on what's where it's touching is more to the north side than to the uh, um, than to the south side, and certainly the southwest side. Um, some people paint the trunks too. It, it does provide some benefit, but these tubes do much better. And remember, take off the tubes come spring. Don't leave them on year round. Oh my gosh! Look at that. Uh, you know, I bet we're going to see winter burn this, this winter. A lot of the areas, eastern part of the state, everything went into winter dry. It's been warm, so that's dehydrated and more. And we're going to get some winter winds, and it is just going to suck the moisture out of these plants. And come spring, we'll see that winter damage because now everything is greening up and it'll be brown. One thing you can do is wrap them in burlap, one that looks pretty ugly, but also it'll trap moisture and you can get ice buildup. Um, so it's better to do is that little insert and just have a screen, you know, just on the south side of it or the southwest side. You don't really need to block it or whichever direction your winter winds are as well. But don't tightly wrap your plants. I mean, one, it takes away from why do you have an evergreen in your yard anyway? Um, but, um, uh, you can also do this. This was done commercially and interesting enough, the reason this was done was not so much for winter burn, but for salt. Uh, these are arborvitae and arborvitae do not like salt. And this is right next to uh dry for a parking area at a large convention center. And they have this up so that 
all that salt laden water is not being sprayed up onto the foliage and it'll damage it. And I've seen people do this in Sioux Falls if they're along a busy road where they're going to get that splashing. Uh, by the way, the salt can be carried even 150 feet in the spring as a dust. So sometimes our salt damage actually occurs a little later in the year. And that's why I recommend if you're never busy straight and they use a lot of salt, uh, in the spring, if you can just take a hose and wash those plants down and get any of that dried salt off them, uh, that really helps. It's amazing in a study we did just how much salt damage there is. And it's not because the salt gets in the soil. It's the salt is, as it dries on the road, is taken up and deposited on the plants in the spring, and it causes a problem. And if we have a rainy spring, we don't see a problem. If we have a dry spring, we certainly do. Oh, Christmas. Yeah, that's coming up. Uh, you wouldn't know it. I mean, these stores have had Christmas up since October. Um, so I think 4th of July decorations will be up in another week. Uh, but, you know, I bet a lot of you are saying, I'm going plastic. What the heck? I'm buying my tree from overseas and they're going to ship it over. Um, and by the way, if you're saying I want to be environmentally sound, uh, sure, buy a plastic fake tree, but you better keep it a long time. Uh, some of the studies that I've read, I mean, you bet, if you keep it for two decades, sure, you made a, a reasonably good decision. Uh, if you keep it for less than five or that, because, yeah, you don't like the color to it or something other, it'd be better to buy the real Christmas tree. And obviously, being a tree guy, I'm not a plastic tree guy. I'm a real tree guy. So I'm not a real fan of these, but if you came to our house, you would see one set up. We do one of each, uh, but, um, and they do have their place. So I'm not knocking it entirely, but you know, give me a, give me a real tree. Uh, lots are filled with them. Not as many as they were in past years. Why that drought has impacted the production. A lot of these trees take 10 years, 12 years to grow. You get a drought, it slows them down a little bit. So a lot of the Christmas tree stands, uh, stands out there are not filled with as many trees as you normally see. And that and in South Dakota, at the eastern end of the state, uh, firs have really become the popular tree. I like them, to be honest with you. You know, they're going to run you 60 to 80 bucks, depending on the height, these Fraser firs. For all you folks in the Black Hills, of course, you can get a permit and go out and cut a tree yourself. Uh, spruce, obviously, coming out of the Black Hills or a little ponderosa pine, mostly spruce. And in a, in a reminder to people, the white spruce that grows out in the hills can have a musty odor. So it doesn't mean they all do. But you can have it where you set the tree up in the house and then you go away shopping for the day and you come back and it smells a little like mildew. That's your tree. Maybe put an air freshener on it. It's not a, not a not a mold or anything. They just kind of have some. Some of them have an off smell. Uh, but furs, no, furs are great, uh, and they're a great tree to buy. I've been a big fan of them. Um, reminder: when you get your tree home, whether you cut it yourself at a choosing cut or out in the Black Hills. Or you picked it up at a Christmas tree stand by anywhere. A lot of clubs sell these trees as well as the box stores. Recut the base. But don't recut the base until the minute you're ready to put it in water, which means you better have a Christmas tree stand. Now, there's our Christmas tree stand about three weeks ago when I pulled it off the shelf in the garage. That's not a very nice Christmas tree stand. You really want to clean them out, get rid of all the goo in them. Yeah, it'd be better if you did it when you put it away. I get it. But clean it up, uh, wash it out, little Clorox in it. It's not so much that you're going to infect anything with it. It just looks pretty slimy. Now, here's an interesting tip. When you're putting water in the base tree, and remember, you want one that holds at least a gallon because they'll soak up a lot of water right away. Um, there's a couple of recent studies that showed use hot water. And I get why, because you're trying to open up all those sap covered pores. So it'll absorb water better. So if you're saying, you know, what's a, what's a great tip to extend the life of my real Christmas tree? 
Well, first of all, don't put it in direct sunlight. Don't put it next to hay fence. Heaven forbid, put it next to a fireplace. But make sure you start with a clean stand that can hold a gallon of water at least and never let the water run out. And the first time you put water in it, hot water. Okay, after that, no, don't worry about it. But you never want it to dry out. Once it dries out, it's not going to take up water again. So that, and people say, well, you know, should I put aspirin in it? Nah, unless it has a headache. Uh, should I put vodka in it? Boy, there's a waste of a valuable product. Um, Rota might mention something about cats and vodka. Probably isn't good for them. Uh, dogs either, for that matter. So you don't want anyone drinking out of that, unless it's a Christmas guest, I guess. Uh, sugar, no. Seven up, no. Um, leftover turkey, no. Uh, the only thing you want to put in there is water. That's it. Preservatives really don't matter. Uh, so take good care of it. And uh, with that, I I wish I could have found a better way to do this. So I just cut and paste. If somebody wants to attend, they might have to use their phone and just take a picture of this so they can type it in. I wish we had one of those little um, little Q codes that we could have shown you. But tomorrow from noon to one Mountain Standard Time, obviously one to two. Uh, Central Standard Time on Zoom, you can register for uh, my session, our, and our monthly forest health uh, update through the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources. And tomorrow I am going to be talking in more detail about Christmas trees. You know, which ones can you get if you don't have one yet from Fraser firs all the way to Eastern Red Cedars and even Rocky Mountain Juniper and some of you folks up by Murdo might say, well, yeah, they are pretty nice trees. And, you know, and nobody likes them in their pasture anyway. Bring them in the house, uh, at least for uh, a month. Uh, but they can make actually a fairly decent tree as well. Uh, and a little bit more on selection and what to do when you're picking them out and care. And then what do you do with them after Christmas? They're kind of a leftover at that point. Uh, and how do we uh, work with it? And what, other, what, what might you be able to do with that? what was a living Christmas tree and now maybe your mulch and a lot of cities do collect that. So if you'd like, uh, there's the, the uh, registration link. I know it's a long alphabet soup of letters, but uh, if you'd like, uh, I hope to see you there tomorrow and we'll spend a little bit longer discussion on it. And so with that, I'm going to hit the stop sharing. There we go. And Sorry. Oh, yeah. Wow. Will that uh, session be recorded? Uh, it better be. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and that's up to somebody else. I mean, to hit the button. I just do the programming. But thank you for asking that, because uh, if you go to the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources page, there'll be Forest Health. And if you go to that page, you can find recordings of all the Forest Health uh, monthly webinars that I've done and they'll have the title too so you can say hey I want to look at the one on spring planting or tree selection or emerald ash borer and now there'll be one for Christmas uh, we haven't done that before but it's probably worth doing because a lot of people will be out this weekend getting their tree I'm going to <sighs> put that in the chat oh thank you I appreciate that okay. uh, do we have any questions uh, yes, um, I have one. <laughs> okay. Uh, about the back to the firewood, and I saw there was one other. Uh, so it's two parts. What is heat treated? And can you tell by looking at it whether it's been heat treated? No, you can't. That's a great question. It uh, USDA requires it 160 degrees, and that's kind of like a turkey. It's got to be <laughs> that temperature inside it, not on the outside. Uh, for 30 minutes, and that will kill any of the insects that are in that wood. Uh, but no, it's going to look just like uh, seasoned firewood. In other words, firewood that has been set out for more than six months and has dried enough that it's cracking. The only thing that I notice, and it's not a real good one, is that uh, the bark tends to separate very easily from this heat-treated wood. So quite often it's separated on the firewood. But the the real way you tell is they'll be in bundles and they will have the label on it. 
And that's why when I did find one at a gas station that did not, we checked up on it and they just taken the labels off and no, no, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, okay, maybe you don't want to sell Iowa firewood, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, people need to know that this is safe because that's an excellent question. The only way you know for certain is that bundle should be labeled. If we have 60 to 65 degrees in the next two days, do we have to do anything to help protect the plants? We're um, supposed to be 63 here tomorrow. Oh, my God. I know. You know what? I'm going to go for a long <laughs> bike ride Thursday afternoon just because just I can. You know what? That's a good question for both of us. We'll both take a stab at it. Uh, right now, when I check soil temperature on the state, we are at pretty close to freezing or at freezing. And the point of that is if you add water to the soil, it's really not going to go in much. And so I really don't see a lot of benefit to watering right now. It's something we've been encouraged people to do in September and October. Um, so really for this short blip, I don't really think there's much you can do. It's a lot of things that you should have done. But the next couple of days, I, I mean, our soils are pretty darn hard here. Yeah, the water is not going to really percolate in. And uh, I'm, I'm more concerned, and maybe Rhoda can add this too, that if if it stays warm and we get a little bump of warm weather and then the temperature just drops right off, and I'm talking minus 17, which we have seen in the past, I'm not sure all our plants are going to have gone to their deepest hardiness yet. And I think we may see some winter injury just because they've gone through a long, mild fall. And we have not had those freezes and thaws and a gradual drop in temperature. I mean, 63, remember last year? It was it was cold. Yeah. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Rhoda, but I can't think of anything people can really do right if, now. If they've had a thick, say, of three, four inches of bark mulch around the tree. Yeah. Will the soil be warmer? It would it be worth watering in that case? It could be. And, and I'll say this too, in all the studies, it hasn't really caused any damage. What you end up with is a crust of water, which might harm your grass. I will mention that. Grass doesn't do well with having ice on top of it. So you could add a little water and see if it goes in. I mean, the, the trunks are not frozen yet. And they are going to give off some moisture. It just may be that you're not able to replace it. So uh, that's a good one. If you can pull the mulch away and you can stick a, uh, uh, my typical gauge is a screwdriver. Uh, if I can push that in, we'll add some water. If it soaks in over an hour, well, yeah, go ahead and water. And that's probably more a point out where you live, Rhoda, where actually winter watering is more common because... Yeah you'll get those warm temperatures and it can be beneficial where East river it tends to be once it gets cold, it stays cold. And, yes. uh, and, and we're out of luck then. So, <laughs> wow. 63. <laughs> December. Yeah. I mean, is this, is this going to be a Christmas that I'm wearing shorts? Uh, I mean, last year I was pushing snow at this time, so I don't know, but we're regressing. Any more questions from anybody? <laughs> we're, we're kind of out of time. I think that's about it. Oh, what a, what timing it's at 8 PM, <laughs> uh, central time. I'm going to step outside without a jacket, uh, and head home and tomorrow probably show up. Well, not like my students, they were wearing shorts today. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, they'd be willing shorts tomorrow and the next day. Uh, but, uh, maybe go out and play some golf. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but do something. So for uh, me, you know, happy holidays to everybody. I hope you, uh, have a good one. And then, uh, uh, we won't see you in February, uh, but, uh, our team will. And then hopefully some of you that want to get a little bit more of the Christmas spirit can, uh, come on tomorrow and. We'll talk to you about Christmas trees. So from my end, I'll say goodbye and happy holidays to everybody. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and, and all the other holidays. <laughs> Best of us. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. On that note, we will we will leave. So thanks again, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.